All right. So thank you guys for spending the last part of your day uh, with me to talk a little bit about triasis or triconics. Excuse me. Um, so what we're going to talk about a little bit. We're going to give them an intro introduction, <clears throat> kind of a little bit of information about me. Uh, what exactly are control systems and why do we care? Current state of affairs, kind of security of control systems as they are, kind of pre the whole Trisis Triton announcement. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to talk a bit, a bit about Triton itself or Trisis, kind of get dissect a little bit into what it is and subsequently why, again, we should care as, as ICS professionals. Uh, and what this means for both the safety and the security industry. Uh, nation state interest, there's always nation state interest, particularly when you're talking about the possibility of loss of life. Uh, what can be done? So a few things that could be done, and a few things are about crisis that make it a little, little more manageable, at least in its current, in the current, current incarnation. We're going to bring it all together kind of at the end, and then there's going to be some questions and comments. Does that sound good for everybody? All right. So introduction. And since I don't have a click, I'm going to just kind of bring all these up. Um, so, of course, there's security concerns um, with the, control, the industrial control domain. And this is not new, right? It's been like this for some time. There's been, I have been. Uh, Okay, pokey. Yeah, no, not so much. All right. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I mean, it's, can you hear me? Okay. All right. So security concerns with the industrial control uh, domain are not a new phenomenon. Again, we've seen this before. We've seen, we've been seeing ICS control system stuff for a long time. Um, increased visibility, business drivers, a number of different things make the ICS control industry it's in and of itself very, very challenging from a security perspective. Cyber physical concerns. So you're starting to see a lot more around cyber physical concerns, around interactions between cyberspace and the cyber components of an industrial control system, and the actual physical components that are, that make up the actual environment. And lastly, but all good things have to come to an end. And so we begin. So a little bit about me. Um, actually, a whole lot about me, but I'm not going to go through all of that. Uh, basically, I've been doing this for about 25 years or so, so a quarter century. Kind of makes me feel really old when I put it in perspective. Um, I spend a lot of my time working with oil and gas customers particularly around building security and cybersecurity into the actual components that we sell and the actual components that they have in their environments. And so we build that capability by programming logic, by hardware capabilities into the assets. And then we help them help these assets to be more defensible and more survivable in the event of some sort of malicious attack. So what exactly are control systems and why do we care? Okay, so a control system of any type, right, is basically an automation system that is kind of autonomous in that it has you hand it programming of some sort and it does an individual function. And that's that's pretty much it. Um, anything can be a control system, right? Anything that you can program and let run on its own can be a control system. Um, and so, of course, they could be anything simple from just a general control loop all the way to very, very complex control systems, things like power grids or things like manufacturing plants or water supply plants and any of these things. Every control system has four principal elements, measurement, control, output, and processing. 
So what you see up here is kind of a typical layout of an ICS control environment. Not any type of environment in general, but just, or in, in specific, but just a general control environment. So typically what you have is some sort of plant level operation, some sort of something that is controlling some area of processing. And then subsequently that area of processing, it has some sort of physical or magic manifestation out in a field or out in a factory or manufacturing environment or something. And if you notice, just for, just for a little pretext, the red areas are going to be the areas that we're going to be talking about today around the actual safety control systems that help to govern some of these process environments. So what makes control systems unique? Just kind of put these out there so you can be looking at them while I'm doing this. All right. So ICS networks are different, right? They are not typically built necessarily as typical enterprise networks are built. Um, there's different types of segmentation or sometimes not segmentation at all. There are times where they're quote unquote air gapped. Um, there are times where they're actually, there's data dials to where you can only have one directional unit, one direction communication or have multiple dials the way you have one way, one path of communication coming in, one path of communication going out. Um, these, the, all the different things that are happening in ICS can actually control individual processes as well as automation for entire environments. Visibility is very challenging in this space. Oftentimes, we're talking about very low latent environments. We're also talking about environments that have limited bandwidth capacity that also have very, very limited spaces capacity for anything. Um, they may be sitting out in a field somewhere where there's very, it, where the, the environment is very hostile. Um, and so, it, you know, getting visibility into what these assets are actually doing can be very, very difficult. Um, the implementations of the actual control components themselves typically are very proprietary in nature. Um, and so, and they're, because they are so purpose built and because they're so specific in their function, oftentimes they are very, very purposely built for a very specific function in a specific place for a specific entity even. Um, lack of basic controls in some instances. So the things that we take for granted in IT around some of the systems and some of the operating systems that run on these components, those things oftentimes do not exist within these actual components. And they don't exist because they were not part of this engineering spec that, required, that was required when they were built. Um, AV, things like that are very, very difficult <laughs> to put on a control system of any type. Um, it will damage it uh, almost always. Um, of course, the, 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 the 100, the 100, you know, million dollar question is, can somebody die? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, many of these control environments, particularly when you're talking about things like chemical plants, or you're talking about water filtration, or you're talking about oil and gas, if these systems don't perform the way they're supposed to, people can die. Um, and as we're going to talk about a little bit when we start talking about trisis, we'll kind of start to understand why that is. Um, the attack methods that are in this space, however, are very similar to what you find in IT because you're starting to see more IT systems being used within control and system environments. And so because of that, you're not introducing things that we typically thought were purely IT based. They are now being introduced and brought into kind of your OT domain. And so now we have to kind of deal with that because of that. So current state of affairs. So right now, there's been this huge push over the last last few years or so to increase visibility into ICS. You know, what does that look, you know, what does this traffic look like? What is net normal? What is our normal relative to something else or somewhere else? And so you've seen a number of tools come on, on, uh, come on, number on the market trying to explain what, you know, and help you understand what your net normal is and decide, define what anomalies are within your space. However, what we're finding is that there are systemic vulnerabilities in ICS, in the control system environment. Some of it just has to do with the fact of how they're built. So these systems, many of these systems are using really old or operating systems. Because of their proprietary nature, they're very difficult to patch. And so you have kind of this systemic vulnerability that exists within the space just because of the, by, by virtue, pure virtue of you having to have these components that oftentimes have a very, very long time to be replaced or, you know, for their evolution to, to go by and be replaced and, and taken out. 
Um, we're also starting to see a lot more activity around our nation states, particularly kind of the big four, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But we're starting to see a lot more interrogation and reconnaissance around our control system infrastructure. So things around water, things around power, as you can imagine why that would be. And we can talk, we'll talk about that a little bit later here in the presentation. Um, and then lastly, um, some of these industries are far more mature than others. I will tell you that the majority of the industries that are really mature are the ones that are being regulated. Um, so power utilities typically are, are pretty advanced in their security posture generally because they're regulated. Um, things like water is regulated, so those industries tend to be a little, little further along. Oil and gas, not so much, um, because again, there's nothing necessarily pushing them to go do that. Um, doesn't mean they're not doing anything. It just means that they're, it's not nearly as structured as it is for regulated industries like nuclear or power. So some nation state implications here. So there's no secret that our critical infrastructure needs some work. I mean, I think anyone, everyone in this room can agree that our critical infrastructure, all of our sectors, need a little bit of work. Um, it's also no secret that these critical infrastructures were never designed with the type of connectivity and openness that we are now bestowing upon them. The business itself has driven the, the, the connectivity, if you will, into this space, and because of that, we are now playing catch up. Right, so the people that are in this space are not playing catch up and trying to, okay, now we need to figure out how do we secure these assets? How do we secure the data going in and out of there? How do we prevent data that we don't want to leave that domain from leaving? Then lastly, critical infrastructure is not only strategically important for the entities that own it, but in for the major 16, they are critical from the standpoint of our, of our national sanctity and our actual national sovereignty. So inner Triton. So this is kind of what we're, this is, this is kind of getting to the heart of, of this conversation. Um, why is it a game changer? And why should we be worried or concerned? So Triton, aka Trisis, you will see, you will see both in literature. So it was specifically designed to target a very specific component set from Schneider Electric, basically their triconic system, which is a safety and SIS, or a safety instrumentation system. Um, it was capable, of, or is capable, of taking down an entire plant and shutting it down. Um, it directly impacts the SIS, so it actually targets the controller component of the SIS. And the kind of the, the key tech behind this is that that controller, by default, is shipped in programming mode. Don't know why. Just is. And what was happening is that wasn't necessarily covered in the literature that this controller was shipped in programming mode. When it's shipped that way, it means that you can push commands to it, that you can change the program, you can change the logic of it without having to actually do much beyond just a, just a core, inter core interaction. If it had been shipped in run mode, as it should have been, then we wouldn't be talking about prices. Right? But it also kind of goes to this notion of when you are dealing with control systems, you also have to make sure that they are configured correctly. Um, and that the things that the security controls that are there have to be used. And oftentimes they aren't. Um, this can, again, it can completely shut down a plant. In its, in its worst state, it can actually shut something completely down. And kind of, kind of a general overview. So the SIS kind of lays underneath the general critical processes of a plant or a facility or an, an operation. And what it is, what is specifically designed to do is to keep the, those control, those critical processes from running errant. It's to keep them from running outside of whatever the boundary or the vector is for their operation. If it, if something moves outside of what is controlled by the SIS, then it is designed to fail safe it and shut it down. Um, which is what it's supposed to do, right? That is, that is its job. If I can change the logic of that, though, and change where those set points are, I can do some really evil stuff, right? Um, now, there are some caveats in that many of these systems, and most of these systems, still have very mechanical fail-safes as well that are backups to the backup to the SS. 
And so there are mechanics, with some of these components, there are mechanical fail-safes that if it, like a boiler overheats or if it gets too hot and the SAS fails, it still will shut down the boiler. That's not always the case, but there are some instances where that is. So if you, as you can imagine, there, there's some, some, some implications here around loss of life particularly, and certainly a lot of damage of equipment. Um, in this case, the target was a Saudi Arabian oil and gas facility. And it was completely shut down in December 2017. So for any of you that are, that are political science scholars or people that care, um, Saudi Arabia, right, is largely a Sunni population, right, by and large, about 90, 93, 94%. If you think about attribution, you think about who would want to do this to them, right, there, there's probably one country in particular that comes in mind that's largely Shia. That's like a border country. Um, and so just kind of think about that as we start talking about nation states and nation states that are interested in doing this kind of stuff, what the, why, why Triton would have, A, been so targeted and so specific and how that could have come about. So this is, this is basically a picture of the system that was largely compromised. And I don't have a pointer and I'm not going to walk over there because I'm going to get that. But down along the bottom, the bottom section of this, is the actual SAS itself. And so all of the systems that are comprised of the SAS solution itself, as well as the interconnects to individual processes inside of the operation. This solution, what it does is it basically loops itself into these processes and it monitors them. And it monitors these, it monitors these processes in such a way the way it's sampling. And it's making sure that whatever is coming out of the control loop is actually what it's supposed to. If it is not, then within a certain degree of tolerance, it'll, it will alarm and alert the operator and say, hey, something's not exactly right here. If it continues to be out of variance, it may halt that process or it may fail that process entirely. It'll change an alert, the operator will get an alert, and then they go to that, that process or that machine and they figure out what's wrong. In the case of Trisis, if I change that or alter that, the operator thinks everything is net good. He thinks he's looking at it, everything's great. There's another, there's another piece of malware that did the same thing, but it did it against some centrifuges, and I'm sure that you guys can remember kind of what this was. Very, very similar in mechanism. The approach and the delivery is different, but the idea of I'm presenting one thing to you on a screen and something else is happening on the back end, that is duplicative, that's basically duplicative action from Stuxnet and Havix and some of the other ones. So this is ground zero. This is the controller, the actual controller that was kind of the target of all of this. Now, as you can imagine, these controllers and the, the tech around this SIS is very, very specific. The How it's configured in an environment, how it's looped into the processes, where it's looped into the processes is very, very specific, which would mean that you would have to be someone that not only knows triconics, but you would have to have specific knowledge about how Triconics is laced into a specific environment, which means that there was probably some espionage in this process. You know, it has not been confirmed nor denied, and so I don't want to. I don't want to say that there's been some, some degree of attribution. There probably is, but it hadn't been announced. But you would think that in order for someone to have this depth of knowledge about how that factory works or how that oil and oil and gas facility works, they'd have to be in it and would have to have, have to have been in it for a while in order to get this kind of knowledge to build a piece of malware that could specifically deal with this. And also know that it is in programming mode as opposed to in run mode, that you physically have to be in front of the console in order to do that. So what does all this mean? So areas that we thought that we had isolated because typically your SIS is either completely offline from networking altogether or it's so cordoned down and so locked down that you know exactly what machines are getting to it and when and who. Now, that may not matter so much anymore. Um, and uh, something else, there's a concerted effort here for nation states particularly to learn how to do that, right? Not only for triconics, but the, when wild, certainly triconics is a very, very specific type of attack. It's a very specific, very targeted 
very purposeful attack. It does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that another another manufacturer, Honeywell, GE, Rockwell Automation, can't have the same kind of vulnerability. And it also doesn't mean that someone is not in a plant somewhere in a in a facility or in a country that they hate learning the tech around the vulnerabilities of specific systems and how to build very specific malware. Right? That's we've seen this happen. This is the fifth one. This is the fifth one that we've seen that is so custom built and so purpose built that it would it has to be nation state driven. It has to be an inside job, espionage level, inside job. And it had a long duration of time in order for them to be able to do that. And that's really, really scary and really, really concerning. Um, the light, and again, you know, this is, this is, in my opinion, uh, we've maybe encountered the first one of these that is purely, that's you know, purely attributable for a cyber to have impacted or have the ability to impact safety. Um, up until now, it, the relationship between cyber and safety has been kind of this moving target where oftentimes you don't necessarily get the telemetry off of the assets when they fail to be able to determine whether or not it's cyber or trivial or it's actually just a malfunction. Because that environment's modus operandi, right, is to pull it out, get it back up. The environment has to continue to operate. And so oftentimes there's not a post-mortem that's done on an asset. If it's a dumb piece of metal that has one connection or one something that's running on it, the only thing we're going to do is we're going to take that thing out, we're going to drop it in a box, and we're going to slap another one in and keep moving. Right? And that thing's going to go back and it's going to be RMA'd, and it might, they might do some sort of triage or root cause to try to figure out what happened to it. More than likely, it's certainly not going to be forensic level. It's going to be, oh, well, this piece of of EEPROM or something had like a had like a wrong code error or a wrong signal or something sent to it. And that's it. That's what you're going to get from it. Um, you just, you typically don't have the time, right, to, to do that, to do that kind of postmortem on these assets. So as you can imagine, some of our nation state friends are particularly interested in, in prices. Um, and they have been following it and looking at it very, very closely, obviously. Um, the big four, you know, with the, the ones that we all love to hate, uh, Iran, China, North Korea, and Russia, uh, all of these are very interested in what Trisis can do. And again, it's not just Trisis, it's the tradecraft around the methodology of how it works. Because if I can, if I can find that same type of deficiency in another manufacturer, then I can still use the same capability and the same tradecraft to duplicate that. Now, it may take time as the crisis. But if I have people in the facility that can be compromised, right, for whatever period of time that takes, that can tell me how these processes are linked in, how the SAS is linked in, what it's communicating to, what can talk to it, I have all the information that I need, and now I have the tradecraft on knowing that conceptually we can do this. And so all I have to do is just spend that time writing code and maybe have this operative that's inside of that facility kind of test it out every night. Kind of see, you know, okay, can, how far can it get? Can it get detected? Can it be detected? Those types of things. Um, this changes how we as ICS professionals protect critical infrastructure, as you can imagine. Um, because up until this point, we typically didn't spend a lot of time with SAS systems because, again, they were, they were, we thought they were hoarded off and that there was no or limited connectivity to them. That is not the case. And Trisis specifically has shown us that that is not the case. And so while general practice is to take your SIS and to isolate it by segmentation and firewalls and things like that to the extent that you can, we're seeing right now that that's not happening. And so if that's not happening in other places, it's quite possible that it's not happening in the US, United States either. And this is obviously is, is very worrisome, right, for the critical infrastructure, knowing that we already have challenges in the control portion of the critical infrastructure. Now, we got to also be concerned about the safety components of it, too. Um, these nation states, again, this is absolutely a nation state activity. There's, there's no question. And it is very fun. It's very well funded, and it is intentional. And it is 
guarantee is a guarantee it is specifically designed to damage and or kill it without question it is a weaponized piece of malware that very specifically is designed to damage that system that is managing whatever processes that it's managing and that's it there's no there's no mincing words about that so again this brings in again this kind of this this it kind of reignites this whole notion of this very specific very targeted malware and again when you start thinking about things like havoc and crash override and you know you start thinking about things like stuxnet this is a very very scary form of malware and it is not it is not a traditional malware in the sense that i'm taking a vulnerability an actual vulnerability and exploiting it. I'm exploiting a configuration error, right? So it's not that I, I can't go out and write a signature for the existence of some in, something in memory, because what the the thing that's in memory is just a configuration error, right? And I'm not going to see that necessarily in a heuristic. I can't write up an, an AV or some sort of signature heuristic to see that. Uh, we hadn't gotten that good yet. Maybe ten years down the line, maybe we're not we're not that good yet. And certainly not in a control environment. We're just not that good yet. So what can we do? This is always the, we always get this question. What can we do? Because Triton is so specialized, it actually is an impediment to itself. Because something that specialized has to have all of this information, it cannot scale very well. Which is a good thing. That's a good thing for us as, as defenders. It is so targeted that it goes after a target and it does whatever it's going to do to that target. Right now, today, and I said, if you notice, I'm caveating these with for now. Right now, today, we are not seeing this type of malware move and jump. It is fire at a target and take the target. That, I believe, will not be the case going forward because someone is thinking about how to make this move around. We can we can bet money on it, and if I can do that, if I know an entire facility uses this, the triconics, say for instance, or I know a cluster of facilities use triconics, then I may be able to link those attacks together. It's just a Python. It's just it's Python scripts. It's four, four Python scripts. That's it. That and there's two that actually write the logic, and two that test for a specific type of something. You know, it's not, you know, there's not nothing, nothing magical there. Now, you can look for the EXEs, the actual compiled EXEs, if you know what they are. Or if you have an assumption <laughs> that you, that you may have this thing in your environment. Or if you have the visibility to actually look on the wire in the environment and actually see it, which most people don't. So there, there's a lot of challenges with finding this kind of stuff. And, by the way, you also have to figure out that it's going after an actual configuration error, not a piece, it's not something that's sitting in memory that's, that has some sort of behavioral heuristic of some sort. It, that's simply not the case with us. Um, again, the inability for it to scale rapidly, again, because it's so custom built and it's so, it takes so much time to actually figure out the exact processes and the exact pathways through an environment in order for it to actually be useful, it takes a long time to do that. So it doesn't scale very well. However, do not, and I, re I repeat, do not become complacent with this. Because not only is Triconics and the Triconics solution set was not, it was not only was it vulnerable to this, but the tradecraft, again, can be used virtually anyway. And so while we've certainly tied up, you know, Schneider Electric, once they realized what this was, Right, they loaded it up the virus total for some reason. God knows why. Um, and once they realized that, okay, this is what's happening, they they created an update that switches the mode, and they reached out to customers and said, "Hey, switch the mode to running mode as opposed to program." And this kills Triconics. It's, it's dead. It's dead on arrival. But for the folks that have already been affected, and we right now we don't know who's impacted. We know the Saudi Arabia and all the facility was impacted. Just because we did, right? It shut it down, and therefore it made the news and all this stuff. We don't know where else <laughs> Trice is sitting, or where it's sitting dormant, or where it's still learning, 
or where it's trying to, you know, figure out, okay, well, they, they found this method, so what else can I do? You know, or if it's being weaponized with further modules, right? Things with like Stuxnet and Habits, they are very modular. And so they can be weaponized with other components to do other things. Well, this is no different, right? This is, this is absolutely no different. Isolation strategies continue to be the status quo for, for SS. And it's really the best tool that we have to try to secure those environments. We have to certainly have a lot of knowledge about how they interact, how they're interlaced amongst each other. We also have to understand what the actual fail modes are. Because some of these SSI systems, they don't necessarily fail safe. They just fail. Um, and then whatever process or whatever component that they are protecting against, does it have fail safe? Does it fail safe? Does it shut down normally? Does it, does, does it have some sort of aberrant shutdown and therefore cause explosions and things like that? Well, bringing it all together here. And I promise I'm almost done. All right. So again, this is a turning point, right? This is, this is a turning point, and anyone that works in critical infrastructure should definitely take notice of this. Because in your environments, I can almost guarantee you that you have anywhere from 100 to two or 300 different vendor types in your environment. That's going to be supplier vendor types. That's going to be components. That's going to be major components, minor components. Anything that you can think of, you have it in that environment. Even stuff that you don't know about. You know, someone needed extra network connectivity. So they plugged the net gear into the wire. You know, and I and don't laugh and scoff because I've seen it. And we've gone out there and said, well, what's that? Well, we needed extra, we needed extra connectivity, so we just plugged it in. Um, the safety processes that are managing these critical processes, those are now being targeted. So the things that we thought we could rely on to help us in this fight, we now necessarily can't trust them either. So now we have our operators kind of running and flying blind. Um, again, this blueprint that's being created, this is not a model. And so you will see other types of attacks come about as by virtue of what has happened with Trisis. It won't look necessarily just like it, but the actual tradecraft around that, you can bet. Uh, again, the, 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 the fact that we can't do rapid scale, that they can't do rapid scale on this helps us um, because it's going to take a long time for these different types of solutions to be created. Um, and so that may give us a little bit of lead time to try to get in front of it, maybe. Um, our landscape obviously has changed because now we're dealing with and looking at areas that we typically didn't believe that we needed to or that we needed to spend a lot of time with. And lastly, um, the defense and death strategies, again, that we typically have had for ICS, we now have to account for this additional vector and this additional, these additional challenges associated with this. And folks, that is all I have. And open it up for questions. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's in the wild. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the wild. It is, but again, it's so specific to the Triconics engine itself and the actual SAS itself that only that only systems that would actually that actually have that specific version of my kind of are actually vulnerable to. Well so it, it is believed that it was that it was brought and introduced into the environment. We don't necessarily, we don't necessarily know how yet. Um, I don't think it, at least from what from the research that I've that I've read, uh, it wasn't necessarily delivered by like a USB cord or USB WSB dongle or anything like that. Um, it it is believed that it was delivered by the network, um, which again, I mean, because of the visibility and the challenges with visibility in that space, wouldn't surprise me. I wouldn't surprise me one bit. But it had to be delivered in such a way or delivered to something that had access to the SIS, right? Because remember, the SIS logically, right, is cordoned off. So it had to be delivered. The, 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 the belief of the kill chain is that it was delivered to a machine 
that had access to a jump host, who then had access to an engineering workstation, that then had access to the SAS front end, which then had access to the controller. That's, that's the kill chain. Now, do we know that for certain? That is, that's what we're guessing. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much.